he possessed one of the most unique harmonic languages in the entire 20th century, which allowed him to write pieces very quickly and for very odd ensembles. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Paul Hindemith. Hindemith was born in central Germany in November 1895. The Hindemiths were poor, and Paul lived with his grandparents for a time before beginning school in 1902. From this point forward, he learned music. He was introduced to the violin while at school, and he ended up studying that instrument at the local conservatory. Thereafter, he served as a freelance violinist in the Frankfurt area. It was always necessary for him to make enough money to pay his own way. As such, he did whatever gig came his way a string quartet, or some pop orchestra. It didn't really matter to him. As World War I raged across the continent, Hindemith found himself drafted in 1917, two years after his father had been killed near Flanders. Hindemith's post as a sentry meant that he didn't see as much frontline action as some other people, but he still had some near-death experiences involving grenades. Nevertheless, he was able to stay somewhat musically active, as he was a bass drummer in a local band, and kept playing string quartets with some other string-playing soldiers. Hindemith was primarily a violinist up until this point in his life. He was a composer in that he wrote music, but he wasn't a professional composer because he wasn't getting his primary source of income from his writing. But we think of Hindemith today as not a violinist or composer-violinist, but as a composer-violist. This change happened sometime around 1919, around the same time as he wrote his sonata in F for viola and piano. He had also written a few string quartets at this point in his life, and one of them was selected for a performance at the first ever Donaueschingen Festival in southern Germany. This was a significant boon to Hindemith's compositional career and aspirations, particularly in the field of chamber music and the exalted medium of the string quartet. Unfortunately, the quartet that was slated to perform this piece didn't like it, and they refused to play it. In order to prevent this piece from going completely unplayed, Hindemith decided to take matters into his own hands, and he formed his own quartet, the Amar Quartet. He was the violist in this quartet, which was named after its first violinist, Liko Amar, who said that he didn't really understand Hindemith's music, but he really liked it. He thought it spoke to him in a really unique way. The quartet remained active as a group all through the 1920s, and performed and recorded a surprising amount of music, not just Hindemith. Hindemith began rising up through the ranks as a composer just as he rose up through the ranks as an esteemed violist. At this point in history, there just hadn't been that many professional violists, as in professional touring violists, like the viola was their primary instrument. Up until this point, the viola was a secondary instrument, something that violinists played. And this is how it got a reputation as being sort of a second-class instrument. As a consequence of the increased number of great violists, Hindemith in Germany, as well as Lionel Tertus and the composer Frank Bridge in England, composers began writing ever more challenging parts for the viola, featuring it in their concerti, using it as a more prominent instrument in their string quartets, writing sonatas for it, etc. Hindemith, like these other musicians, realized that the viola was extremely underutilized, and he wanted to be one of the folks who was not only performing all this new rep, but he was actively contributing to it. Hindemith's compositional output is extremely widespread, and we'll get to the details of his mature style in a minute, but it's important to know that he wrote music in a lot of styles, and his early music is not necessarily representative of what would become the Hindemith sound. We can see hints of what he was to come to write in his early works, but a lot of them are written in styles that we just don't think of as typically Hindemith. He produced several early operas that are highly expressionistic, such as Sancta Susanna and Murder Hoffnung der Frauen, the latter of which is pretty much a complete setting of a super short, super weird play of the same name by the artist Oskar Kokoschka, who you may remember as a one-time lover of Alma Mahler although that really doesn't narrow it down all that much. Those more familiar with Hindemith's later music and later sound are often shocked to find such expressionism and such a masterful handling of the expressionist idiom coming from a young Hindemith. This earlier focus on expressionism gave way to a more cleaner contrapuntal style, but the damage had already been done, because when the Nazis came to power, they saw these early pieces as examples of what they called Intatata Musik, 
aka degenerate music. Anything that they didn't like, thought was excessive, thought was immoral, which is a real hoot coming from them. But all the same, they didn't quite know what to do with Hindemith's music because he'd written all this earlier music in the style they didn't like. But the stuff he was writing at that point when they came to power was a little bit more of what they were looking for. But there were no gray areas when it came to their censorship. It was sort of an all-or-nothing thing. But when it came down to it, it really didn't matter what the lower-ranking officials thought, and it also didn't matter what other musicians who really loved and championed Hindemith's music thought. It all came down to what Josef Goebbels thought, and he did not like it. He more or less sent Hindemith into exile into Turkey, thereafter calling his music atonal noise-making and banning it all throughout the Third Reich. At this time, Hindemith was busy writing a piece that many considered to be his magnum opus, the opera Matisse der Mahler, a historical drama about a painter who wants nothing more than to be able to express what he wants to express without any other interference. This probably didn't help his cause with the Nazis. Regardless for the reasons of his leaving Germany, he probably had to do it anyway. The situation was fast becoming untenable because his wife had some Jewish heritage. He was able to make the best of it in Turkey because he really appreciated being able to educate people on music, and he was able to bring Istanbul's musical life up to par. The young composers and performers of Turkey really thought a lot of him. He didn't stay there very long in the big scheme of things because being that close to a Europe, that close to war once again, was just too delicate a situation. He and his wife moved to Switzerland, and thereafter to the United States. Switzerland saw the premiere of Matisse de Mahler in 1938. While the opera has never been that popular with opera companies, he did get quite a lot of mileage out of it via a symphony that he'd written of the same name. Now, contrary to the popular way that composers ring orchestral pieces out of their large-scale stage works, be they operas or ballets or whatever you might have, he actually wrote the symphony before he finished the piece itself, sort of like the trailer for a movie, as opposed to extracting an orchestral suite after the fact. Hindemith's mature musical language is most closely associated with an artistic movement called Neue Sachlichkeit, which roughly translates to new objectivity. And this is best understood as a reaction against the darkness of Germanic expressionism, which sought to plumb the darkest and deepest depths of the human psyche and soul. Neue Sachlichkeit, by comparison, is not intended to be overly emotional or overly complex. World War I had really ripped Germanic society a new one, and people wanted art that was not going to probe these dark depths of their souls. It's sometimes a little bit hard to pin down exactly what Neue Sachlichkeit means, because it means different things in different forms of art. For instance, the playwright Berthold Brecht was very interested in alienating his audiences. He didn't want his audiences to sympathize with characters in his plays. Rather, he wanted them to be constantly reminded that they were looking at a fiction. And as such, he wanted to use his plays as a form of social critique. Because its primary movers and shakers were left-leaning, or in the case of Brecht, an avowed Marxist, the Nazis really didn't like this, and they more or less shut down the entire objective party. For Hindemith's music, this meant that he began organizing his pitches in an extremely novel way. He took all of the possible intervals and arranged them from most consonant to the most dissonant, a spectrum of consonants to dissonance, if you will, all informed by the naturally occurring mathematical properties of the overtone series. So this is something that he saw was very grounded in science, really. And he also was interested in the phenomenon of combination tones, which, to put it most simply, is the complex interaction of the two overtones of any two given notes. This meant that whenever he needed to ramp up the tension in his music, he used more dissonant intervals and he used more unconventional voicings of his chords in order to make the combination tones more dissonant as well. And whenever he needed to release this tension, he would use more consonant intervals, and more spacings of chords that aligned with the overtone series. It was about how well with the grain you went with the harmonic series if you wanted to be consonant, or how well you pushed against the grain if you wanted to be dissonant. And this controlled the flow of music, and thus the control of form he had over his pieces. Curiously, he considered the tritone, the most dissonant interval in most people's understanding of music and in his particular system, to be something that was harmonically static, that didn't have any sort of harmonic motion to it, 
And this is ironic because the tritone and its resolution is what really defines the dominant seventh chord moving to a tonic chord, which is sort of the basis for common practice tonality. But Hindemith was really not working in the common practice. He was using tonal materials, yes, he was using constant and dissonant intervals. He would have tonal centers and he could move the tonal center around, but he was also free to use all 12 notes of the chromatic scale. When used in full force, all of this gives Hindemith's music the Hindemith sound, which, love it or hate it, you have to admit is totally unique. The objective quality of Neue Sachlichkeit could also be found in the fact that his music is intended to be more universal than just personal statements. It's important to note that Hindemith was extremely interested in justifying his theories from a mathematical and scientific perspective. Because it was all based in the measurable acoustic qualities of the overtone series, he thought of this not just as a great way of organizing music, especially tonal music or neotonal music in an era of atonality, but also as a fundamental analytical tool, and he analyzed pieces from all eras using this approach. This is why he was against forms of composition that were strictly atonal, like Schoenberg's 12-tone technique. His music was able to acknowledge the existence of the overtone series and either went with or against its grain, whereas 12-tone music just sort of totally ignored it. Hindemith's career as an educator in the United States lasted over a decade. He first taught at Yale and then at several other institutions, but he never stopped composing, really until he died, and some of his greatest pieces come from his American years. He came into contact with Leonid Messine, one-time principal dancer of Sergei Diaghilev's famed Ballet Russe, and Messine suggested to Hindemith that he write a piece based on themes of the early German Romantic composer Karl Maria von Weber. This eventually resulted in his symphonic metamorphosis on themes of Karl Maria von Weber, which ended up becoming one of his most widely played works, especially when it was then used as ballet music. He was also commissioned by the acclaimed choral conductor Robert Shaw to set Walt Whitman's elegy When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom, which is about the death of Abraham Lincoln. This was widely regarded as a very American piece, an American masterpiece even. Also from this period is his seminal solo piano masterwork, Ludus Tonalis, which has many translations. I, in particular, like Game of Tones. This piece is almost like Hindemith's thesis defense. This is considered by many to be the 20th century's answer to J.S. Bach's well-tempered clavier. Because when Bach wrote his suite, he decided that he was going to show off A, his contrapuntal chops, B, his mastery of all the different styles on the European continent at that point, and he also wanted to prove the worthiness of the recently invented well-tempered system. He wanted to express to the world that being able to play in all the keys, which had theretofore not been possible, was a real boon to the musician. Likewise, Hindemith used Ludus Tonalis, which alternates interludes and fugues much in the same way that the well-tempered clavier alternates preludes and fugues, to show off a all manner of 20th century compositional devices, and b the worthiness of his own approach to tonal organization. In an era when many composers were flocking away from tonality in droves in order to write music in 12-tone and eventually serial styles, Hindemith set out a striking defense of tonality, even if his idea of tonality was not necessarily the traditional idea. It was an effective argument for keeping tonal relationships relevant, even if in unconventional ways. This is again analogous to Bach if we see Bach as the last, late, great contrapuntal composer, because he was considered old-fashioned in his time as well. In any event, just these three pieces, all from his American period alone, are enough to put Hindemith at the top rung of the most versatile composers who ever lived. When you take into account his entire body of work, you see that he wrote everything from expressionist near atonal operas to American threnodies to the modern version of the well-tempered clavier, and you're just like, what can't this guy do? In 1953, after Europe had had some time to recover from the horror and carnage of the Second World War, Hindemith went back. He retraced his steps, essentially, first moving back to Switzerland, where his last teaching post was, and then eventually back to his basically hometown of Frankfurt. It was there that Hindemith passed away from acute pancreatitis, 
a complication of all the ills he suffered in his later years, in December 1963 at the age of 68. Hindemith was one of the most prolific and versatile composers you could care to name, not just in the various styles in which he wrote, but also just in the number of instruments he wrote for. For instance, in addition to playing the viola, he also played an instrument called the viola d'amore, which is a near obsolete instrument from the Baroque era, and he brought it back in part by writing pieces for it. He also composed trios for troutonium, an early electronic instrument, and scored in chamber music for the hecklephone, a kind of bass oboe, which only ever really shows up in the huge late romantic orchestras of Richard Strauss's operas. The harpsichord even made it into the orchestra of his last opera, Das Lange Weihnachtsmahl. He was also capable of writing music extremely quickly. If a recording session was short a piece, he'd dash off a of work on the train ride over. Much of this hastily written music had a kind of functionality to it, at least in Hindemith's mind. It was often, due to its hastily composed nature, fairly short, fairly straightforward, and importantly, accessible to amateur performers. It was also not necessarily intended to have much of a life beyond the purpose for that which it was written. This is Gebrauchsmusik, which translates usually as music for use, but is more literally utility music. This part of his collected works all fill a very specific purpose. He was able to use his language and his compositional style in these, but they're short and simple and they get to the point. This also, arguably, encompasses some intentionally bad pieces that he wrote, pieces that were parodies of other composers or of other pieces of theirs in particular. This includes a spoof of Wagner's Flying Dutchman Overture. If the overture was played by a string quartet and that string quartet was sight reading it at 7 o'clock in the morning by a well. That's not me trying to be funny, that's actually in the title of this crazy string quartet that he wrote. This kind of music was written for a specific purpose, which is why it's under the banner of Gebrauch's music, but it also contains an element of social critique. Much like a Brechtian play makes the audience keenly aware that they're watching a fiction, much of Hindemith's Gebrauch's music parodies make the listener aware that they're listening to a piece. In that sense, we can see Neue Sachlichkeit as a whole as kind of a meta thing, an art that was not afraid of poking fun, or at least referencing, its own form. Hindemith saw his role as an artist as not really an artist. He thought of himself more as a craftsman, someone who sat down and did his work. He produced music. That was his job. Much like Richard Strauss thought of his music writing as a job. As such, Hindemith really never suffered from anything we might call writer's block. His music as a result is wide-ranging and unpretentious, and fulfills many different roles. All the same, his music is highly theoretically grounded. The greatest sin in art is not boredom, as frequently stated, but rather a lack of proportion, Hindemith once said. The best composers, and thus the best composition teachers, are the ones who understood the necessity for comprehending and synthesizing the past, but were also open to the styles of the present. And while his mature style has a certain characteristic quality to it, and is something of an acquired taste, anyone who says that they don't like Hindemith just because they don't like this style is certainly not seeing the whole picture, because he was such a profoundly gifted composer in all sorts of styles. The multifaceted music he produced is entirely his own, and for his fans, utterly indispensable. 